It's another uh, Tacky Talk time with State Representative Tacky Chan of Quincy. Our weekly discussions uh, ranging from the sublime to the absurd. Hi, Tacky. <laughs> <laughs> well, given today is day after election day, we can go absurd if you like. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's start there then. <laughs> First of all, how are you? <laughs> Well, they're doing not too bad. I know it's getting a little bit chilly, and right? I'm actually feeling it in my bones like everybody else. But uh, overall, it's uh, been a pretty good uh, week uh, thus far, and even though it's only Wednesday. And uh, it's obviously good to see you again and a chance to chat with everybody from the comfort of my living room. Yes. Dining, the- dining room, not living room. My dining room doesn't have anybody to raise a stack four, four or five uh, law books in front of me to get this, uh, get this elevation of uh, screen eye time. We're going to have to add like a cooking segment to this, I think, you know, seeing as you're in your dining rooms, <laughs> have to have some recipes with tacky. Well, I think uh, we did, well, we did the Democratic um, caucuses uh, this past uh, spring. I thought it was going to be um, relatively quick, but didn't realize uh, there was a long uh, dead period of just conversation. I was making dinner in the midst of the dead zone of conversation until I was told by Alicia, turn your camera on. <laughs> Okay. And next thing you know, they see me you know, elbow high in flour, egg, and salmon as I'm making salmon uh, fritter-ish type fried salmon thing. So, so it became like a tacky cooking lesson in the middle of the, the caucus dead space because we had dead space. And this is a good challenge of Zoom, right? I mean, yeah. we're in person, um, you know, you can, you know, congregate in small groups to talk. Uh, you can separate out. You can move from group to group, table to table. Uh, you, on this kind of Zoom format, when you have dead space, it really is kind of extremely awkward. Yeah, it, 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 some people still, you know, haven't mastered it quite yet. They don't quite understand that that uh, you are live and everybody can see and hear you, no matter what you're doing. <laughs> Precisely, and uh, we've had it. It's happened a few times in my public hearings when. Uh, technical difficulties when the testifiers end, and we didn't realize those technical difficulties for a while yeah. because it's not really apparent. Uh, and of course, people know that this is you know record this off on a uh, legislature website, and we also pro- provide streaming on my Facebook page, uh, the State Representative Tacky Chair Facebook. So you can actually see a live stream. But every so often, it, it is kind of unusual circumstance where your people just have a technology issue. We just wait because maybe they reconnect. Um, or maybe there's just like dead air because we're not quite sure what's happening and staff is trying to sort out uh, technology problems uh, yeah. on the testifier side. And there'll be phone calls made from staff to testify trying to see if we can resolve a technical issue. Now we're kind of in this dead spot. And uh, it's hard to do a funny in video format because you're not quite sure if you are funny. So it becomes like this problem of small talk. That's right. <laughs> Actually, let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, uh, pandemic era rules uh, in the state house. I know that I think it was this past Monday was the deadline for members to show proof of vaccination. Is that right? Yes, All members as well as staff uh, are okay. required to have vaccination approved or unless they have a, one of the two exemptions or sincere religious belief or they have a doctor's note indicating they have other conditions that prevents mm-hmm. them to take the vaccine. Uh, they were all uploaded electronically in PDF or uh, picture format to human perfect human resources. I do not know what the status of that is. Is of course it's a health, uh, it's a human resource matter. Um, so I suspect maybe they'll tell us in aggregate. Obviously, we can't find out people's personal health information individually. You can't right. release individual health information, but you can release information aggregate, mm-hmm. uh, provided that it's aggregate doesn't create identifying mm-hmm. uh, identifiers. So uh, we haven't got word yet, but I suspect based on those vaccination responses, we're largely determined about uh, the reopening of the building. Okay. And it's not the same, though, for the Senate side. Is that right? Senate's adopted the same procedure. Oh, Unfortunately, okay. I can't tell you what's going on over there. I'm assuming they're using the same methodology because I have yeah. a hard time believing they're not. I mean, yeah. get us a copy of the card somehow. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, they're also a smaller body, folks. I mean, that's actually kind of a, a mm-hmm. people forget. We're 160, they have 40. They control about uh, one third of the space in the state house. And uh, they have individual offices where they can, uh, they have three separate rooms. They can actually keep the uh, staff segregated. Mm-hmm. So what, and they also can limit people's access into offices through the, through the individual doors. Uh, the, the house side is much more crammed in. Uh, we control probably about half the space in the building. The other, other uh, remaining amounts controlled by the constitutional officers and administrative offices. That's nothing to do with the House or the Senate. And, um, you know, you know, also like the hearing rooms, right, including that. So 
you know, we are we're much more crammed in, uh, and uh, that could just be our concern. I was mm-hmm. in the office on let's see on Monday because I was doing the interview of, of uh, twenty uh, channel twenty five, mm-hmm. and um, we did an outdoor interview uh, in Ashburton Park. Uh, but I mean, again, when I came to my office, I keep forgetting exactly how stale the air is. Mm-hmm. Until I actually sat down at my desk and realized the air doesn't move. Right. And now, you know, getting into the heating season. So uh, windows are going to be closed a lot more, too. Absolutely. And I, my system is a, a forced a hot water system or mm-hmm. hot liquid system. So it's just basically a hot pipe with some a fan underneath it blowing, uh, blowing off the heat. Um, so temperature control is actually very uh, challenging in my office. And, you know, as a result, there is no true uh, airflow because it's not air moving in one vent and not the other vent. It's just circulating the yeah. same air in the room. So, yeah, uh, this is kind of my my office space. And a lot of our spaces are similarly situated. Yeah, so, yeah. Like I said, you don't really think about it to you actually, like, sit there and think about, oh, these are things that I have to be aware of that for decades I never had to think about. Yeah, you know, that's that's what a pandemic does to you. <laughs> you know, that and many other things that uh, have changed forever in our lives, for sure. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, you know, stay tuned. I mean, uh, obviously, the close of session is coming up on the 17th of November. If the speaker wants to actually try to stay the calendar, uh, obviously, he doesn't have to under emergency rooms, but I do believe he's trying to stay the calendar uh, unless a crisis appears. And, uh, you know, given there's only about, you know, essentially 15 ish days left in, you know, the regular calendar session. Uh, you know, perhaps is wiser just to reopen the building uh, next year um, and give us the holiday season to do more preparation for reopening. But like I said, I, I'm still not entirely clear uh, mm-hmm. myself. I just know that there are multiple steps involved in uh, getting uh, a sense of the vaccination status for employees as a big part of it. Sure. Well, as you mentioned, we are recording this the, uh, the day after the uh, election, and I was curious to get your uh, reaction to mostly the Boston mayoral race, Tacky, um, and how you feel about what happened there. Well, I mean, it's the uh, campaign of inevitability. I mean, that, it's, that's what I tell folks uh, about this stuff. Uh, for those who don't know, I've been doing this my entire adult life. I've been watching campaigns of both big and small and even overseas. Uh, trying to glimmer some education from watching other people do things that may apply to me. You, you never know, right? You learn from uh, looking at other uh, races and, and and how uh, campaign techniques have changed. And, uh, you know, the polling had shown uh, Michelle Wu doing extremely well. And I can congr- congratulate uh, Michelle and her team on putting together a really strong campaign, surviving a, a really complex preliminary, uh, working in a pandemic situation. Uh, and going into a, you know, a sprint final. November 2nd is very fast uh, time frame. So meanwhile, I mean, you have Anissa uh, Savi George who uh, came in very late into preliminary, um, you know, was not expected to survive the preliminary crack through it, but was unable to consolidate uh, people that weren't with Michelle Wu into her camp. And this is kind of where she ended up, uh, unfortunately, and the polling reflects that. Um, so, uh, you know, it's it's a tough gig in this politics, as we all know, running campaigns and, and watching it all. But, you know, I wish Michelle Wu and, and uh, the new city councilors in Boston the very best as the inaugural is going to come up in about two or so weeks. Mm-hmm. There'll be no transition time right. from Kim Janey. And there was really no transition time from Marty Walsh to Kim Janey right. as well. So you've uh, had uh, three mayors essentially in one calendar, Marty Walsh. Uh, Kim Janey uh, is the first uh, person of color woman uh, to be mayor of Boston. And now you have the first uh, person of color and woman elected as mayor right. of Boston. Yep. So, I mean, it's very historical in many ways in one calendar year. Yeah. Um, you know, some other fun races. I mean, uh, Yvonne Spicer uh, lost her race in Framingham, the first uh, black mayor in the Commonwealth, a black woman, um, and uh, also the first mayor of Framingham you know, hmm. when it became a city. Uh, she got defeated uh, pretty uh, pretty badly, uh, actually, <laughs> in Framingham, much to a lot of my surprise because, you know, incumbents generally do well, mm-hmm. uh, particularly mayor incumbents, which have all the advantages on so many levels being a mayor. Um, you know, uh, my friend Amy Massangelio uh, ran against an incumbent in Newton. Sadly, she didn't make the cut. Um, uh, Ockerty uh, Banbury, I can't enunciate her name correctly, but, you know, she's a a friend of ours from the state house. She was a staffer for uh, a representative of Marjorie Decker for many years. She made the cut for school committee. So it's good to see an Indian uh, American uh, elected uh, to office in, in Massachusetts, which again is a very few number of Indian 
uh, Americans elected. Uh, mm. So it's good to see a young woman uh, make the cut, so to speak. And uh, yes. see where she goes from there. So even though, you know, they're not, you know, mayors and they're not state reps or state senators or Congress people, I mean, these seats for school committee and council and Adelman and, you know, things like the uh, housing authorities. I mean, some places like the housing authority members or municipal light board members. I mean, those are still very important elected positions uh, that, uh, you know, all people should try to run for and, and make a real difference in people's lives. Yeah. Are you encouraged? I mean, given all the talk that you and I have had uh, over the past year and a half about anti-Asian violence uh, as a result of the pandemic to see Michelle uh, succeed. I think uh, Cincinnati also had an, an Asian American um, elected, I don't know if it was mayor uh, or other uh, position, but uh, taking some leadership roles, um, you know, given what's happened to the Asian American community. Yeah, we're still uh, collectively, even in aggregate, uh, the smallest demographic of electeds uh, in Massachusetts and nationally, actually. Mm. So, uh, those of you who uh, know myself and people like Councilor Lena Liang and Michelle Wu uh, and, um, you know, people who were elected, such as uh, Lisa Wong and uh, Leland um, Clement, um, Leland Chung Clement, mm -hmm. they got Clement from? <laughs> Leland Chung, um, but, you know, there's not that many of us uh, collectively in the state. I understand there's like an Indian a person uh, elected in Needham, Board of Selectmen. Um, I know there's some Chinese school community people that have been elected in places like Acton. Uh, but again, it, it's very far, a very small percentage of all of us. You can barely count on um, your hands and your toes uh, how many Asians are elected to any position in Massachusetts. Mm. So um, the fact that, you know, again, the Asian caucus is up to eight, you know, we represent probably not quite 50 percent, but you know, close to 50 percent of all the elected Asians in the state, no. okay. uh, much less nationally. And even then, uh, actually, a Massachusetts native uh, um, guy, David Chu, uh, who a kid I believe grew up in Hingham, BC High kid, uh, was a uh, what do they call them in California? They're not called representatives. I think they're called um, assemblymen. I think it's assemblymen. Yeah, assemblymen. Basically, they're reps, but they're called yeah. assemblymen. Uh, you know, he just stepped down after seven years as an assemblyman and uh, took the job as the city solicitor of the city of San Francisco. Oh, okay. So, I mean, you know, good for him and congratulations. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he, uh, I know he's not, you know, he's in California, but I mean, he's another uh, local kid, so to speak, that did very well for himself in politics. And, uh, you know, he's got a real big job uh, for a major city. So, you know, we'll, uh, we'll see, we'll see where this takes us. Uh, and uh, I think one of the major challenges of being Asian American these days, as you point out, the Asian anti-Asian racism issues, you got to take the bull by the horns and just stand up for this uh, issue and, um, you know, empower people of color, but also empower Asian Americans, as well as uh, demonstrate an inclusive government, particularly for mayors, and uh, also uh, just stand up uh, for us and just call it what you see it. It is, you know, if it looks like what it is, I'm going to refrain my picking my words carefully, but, you know, you see it, you know what it is, call it what it is. Right. Sugar. Right. right, folks. I mean, you see it, and uh, it is what it looks like. There's no reason why I should deny it's there. Well, I'll be curious to see if uh, you know uh, young Asian women um, are inspired by Michelle's victory uh, in Boston and and elsewhere across the state to maybe look into you know public service as a potential career path in the future. Oh, absolutely. Uh, she is going to be a very much inspiration. She's mm -hmm. 36 years old. She's the youngest mayor the city has seen in probably well into 60 years. Mm -hmm. Um, she has a long uh, career path in front of her that's hers to dictate. It is a major metropolitan city, despite the size. People forget Boston's an international city, despite mm -hmm. being one of the smallest international cities in the world. And again, it's 50% of the GDP in New England comes out of one place, uh, Boston. Uh, New England, it's just not just the state of Massachusetts. Massachusetts represents 49% of GDP in, in New England. But when you really come right down to it, you know, Boston is the major shipping, transportation hub. Education, technology, I mean, whether you hate it, like it or hate it, it doesn't matter. It's the reality, you know, all uh, goods from Maine and New Hampshire head to Boston. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You leave the state and vice versa. Things coming into Maine and New Hampshire has to come through Boston. Right. So, uh, you know, it's it's very, very important role of uh, being the city of Boston. I agree with you. It's absolutely going to create inspiration for other uh, folks to uh, want to run for office. Yeah. Um, 
you know, this age. Meanwhile, at home, it was a somewhat exciting night, actually. Oh, you want to <laughs> talk about it? Okay, sure. Yeah, I mean, congratulations to uh, our uh, counselors. You know, we, uh, you know, Dave McCarthy and uh, Chuck Field and and, uh, and uh, Andrew and uh, Anthony and Dronico. I can't enunciate properly today. <laughs> Dronico, as well as um, you know, counselors uh, No Debona and uh, Emma Honey and Neil Yang. But uh, the, the most exciting race was school committee. It really was. was. Yeah. Yeah. Emily Liebo and Tina Gayhill and Tina is the first time coming on and uh, Doug Guttrell uh, was able to beat uh, Courtney Peridos by um, a hair, essentially, in these kind of races. I mean, 51 hair, votes, yeah. Just over, uh, uh, well, more, a little more than just a hair, but a hair enough. And uh, Courtney had kind of an odd uh, incumbency situation by her appointment. So uh, it's actually interesting where you have a two, a sort of uh, one, you know, basically two incumbents uh, fighting for a third slot. Um, in this kind of a race where you're in a pick, you know, pick up to three situation. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I think you'll still see Courtney very active uh, in the school system, regardless. She always has been, and I'm sure will continue to be. And, um, you know, in two years, there'll be, uh, there'll be more seats open that she can run for again. Oh, I agree with you. I mean, uh, she has actually not my door twice. Uh, so if people actually know where I live. Uh, you don't come down my way to, to knock my door. <laughs> uh, there, there's not a lot of uh, voters, uh, good voters in my geographic zone. <laughs> so uh, I'm always very impressed whenever I can. It makes a little bit of an extra effort to, to uh, come by and say hello, uh, whether they leave a piece of lit or, um, you know, I catch them on my yard or something mm -hmm. you know, any day of the week. Um, so you know, it was a very good ground campaign. And uh, we had a lot of first time folks run this year, this time as well. And a few people that have run before, but, you know, a lot more new folks. And hopefully, you're right, two years is an opportunity to run for city elections and uh, the mayor will be up and uh, right. may, they may be changing the air again. You just, you just don't know. This is what yeah. this business is for. I asked him last night. He'll he'll never tell me. <laughs> he said, he just takes it one term at a time, he says, but I did ask him. <laughs> and uh, I'm fairly confident that, that uh, you know, I'm fairly confident with RBC Mayor Kolka. He's got a lot of projects in the, in the wings, I'm sure he wants to see through, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm fairly confident we'll, we'll see him uh, again in two years. Yeah. Um, you're right. You know, a lot of things can change. I mean, remember Joe Finn uh, left, uh, finally decided after four, was it 14 years? Yep. Uh, he decided that, you know, he, he's done his time and suddenly there was a shakeup with the council then, uh, which created opportunity uh, for, um, uh, for uh, was it Emma? Emma yeah, Emma Honey came in that mm -hmm. round. She was she got, came over from the school committee. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, guys, I'm not going anywhere. I'm for <laughs> I was going to add just, that was my next question, Tacky. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to beat around the bush now. And I'm fairly the speaker will be the speaker in 2022. So yeah, so. okay. I, Actually, I uh, it's, I was, it was mentioned in the Quincy Book of Days uh, last week, I think, that uh, it was your 11th year uh, since you were elected uh, to your current position. Yeah, this is turn number six. It feels like yesterday. Uh, in many ways. Uh, I, I'll admit pandemic has changed how I perceive time, yeah. uh, like a lot of us. Uh, and, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I'm still uh, enjoying how uh, this goes. I, I enjoy my job. People know I have fun with it. I'm realistic. There are good days and bad days, like everything in life. Uh, and I do uh, ride out those good and bad days, like, like everyone else does in life. But I'm still having a lot of fun. And uh, this is a game of seniority. I don't lie about that to folks uh you know the legislature is seniority driven and uh the importance of uh, just basically just biding my time so to speak being patient you know understanding what's going on around me and uh you know making the right moments to uh ask for something um and now i'm in a leadership position for the last three years as a chairman actually four now it's before yeah 2017 four years now uh, and a chairman, and uh, I have a lot of control over a number of policy issues, as well as being a manager of a committee, uh, as well my as well as my committee members with my mm -hmm. other colleagues in the house. You know, they're, they're my committee. I manage the membership at that level. So, uh, you know, it's it's uh, we've talked a lot over the last year and a half. This is a lot of quality time we've had with uh, me and Joe here, and uh, you all watching us. Uh, but you know, hey, I mean. I tell folks when uh, I'll be done with this at some point, but not today. Okay. And that's when the cooking careers takes off. <laughs> <laughs> hey, why not? <laughs> you want a highly uh, allergy friendly diet. Uh, you can come to my house. Give there my you go. <laughs> dietary issues. 
But uh, we talked a little bit about um, redistricting um, Tacky and how that's impacting uh, uh, our area here. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we uh, the House and Senate sent up to the governor's office the redistricting maps. Uh, the governor, I don't believe, has signed it yet for the House and Senate. Uh, the governor can veto those, uh, but given the unique circumstances pursuant to state constitution, uh, representatives have to live in that district for one full year uh, prior to the next election. So in this case, it would be November 8th which is why the time of getting the, these bills up to the governor was very important. Senate does not have the requirement. Senate does not require a one-year residency. Okay. You just have to move in at some point. Congressional folks can actually move in afterwards. I mean, it's a whole... Residency is an interesting thing. Um, and for statewide offices, the Constitution also dictates residency requirements for when you can run for statewide office as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah but you, your reps are unique in the Constitution. Uh, regarding the one-year residency from prior, from uh, one-year full-year residency of, of the election, so um, that's why we had you know such a rush job. Given in fact the census was slow in information, the Trump right. administration was very challenging on getting us data. Pandemic made it hard to collect it, and essentially what should have came out in April came out in in September, mm -hmm. which meant to us rushing through it. So what does it mean at home, guys? So yeah. here's what happened. Uh, Dan Hunt is no longer a Quincy delegation member starting in 2023. Uh, he will be pushed back over into the city of Boston. Um, Bruce Ayers is going to reclaim that district, which is why I call it the best western section of the Ponce River. <laughs> That's a good way to put it, yeah. <laughs> it's, I think it's Ward 3, Precinct 3. Yep, and uh, he will uh, continue to also represent uh, a big chunk of Randolph. Okay. And him and our neighbor, Bill Driscoll from Milton. Uh, we'll basically get split Randolph in half between the two of them. A friend, Mark Cusack from Braintree, is leaving Randolph and picking up a precinct in Holbrook, so will be Braintree and Holbrook. I will remain totally in Quincy, and I go from 13 precincts to 14 precincts, which is uh, the new uh, version of Ward 5 Precinct 2, which now stretches essentially from Central Middle School to um, the Schuster Building and the Wheelhouse Diner in North Quincy. Oh, okay. Yep. So it's a very long Ward 5 precinct, too, and it, it encompasses the entire roadway uh, and parts of the sides uh, going upbound. So also is also unique because uh, this seat is uh, a fully formed Ward 5. Uh, oh. I was thinking about this the other day and talking to our good friend Michael Morris. He has been around a lot longer than I have. And then you know, I asked him when was the last time we had a full Ward 5 seat as a rep seat. And the answer is he, he doesn't remember either because when he ran a rep, uh, you know, Ward 5 was cut up. I know it was not the same geographic design, but it was still a non-unified ward. It was cut up between uh, multiple reps when he ran in a 240 house. Hmm. Um, and uh, that's why historically this has been a Ward 1 seat. So, you know, the Wallace neighborhood is mostly almost all Ward 5. And uh, the Wallace neighborhood is unified in this rep seat for really the first time and before Michael Morrissey's time, um, which is saying a lot, actually. Yeah, well, yeah, that's many, many years ago. Yeah, many years ago, he, he would remember this better than I would. So, uh, you know, there'll be all Ward One, all Ward Five. You know, I'll have uh, two precincts in Ward Four, two precincts in Ward Three. So I basically got Hospital Hill, Potts of Wallison Hill, and then you know I have what we know as Brewers Corner, um, as well as the old cornfields where uh, Montilio's is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, it's a little bit of a zigzaggy, and I didn't draw the precinct lines. The city of Quincy drew precinct lines, but. In good fortune to us, the city was able to put the census blocks inside the precinct lines fairly easily uh, overall, which meant that uh, the when we did our uh, redistricting, we were able to pretty much follow the precinct lines because we are drawing our districts by census block. Sure, yep. So our neighbors to the south, we know Jamie Murphy in Weymouth um, has uh, uh, pretty much stayed contiguous. Uh, where he is now, you know, parts of Hingham, um, and a good speaker, you know, continues to be representing Quincy Point, parts of West Quincy, and follows the river on Weymouth down to Holbrook, mm -hmm. and uh, he loses a uh, ward precinct to um, Mark Cusack in Holbrook, so he has half of Holbrook. Uh, ward 2, uh, in particular, had grown a lot in the census, mm -hmm. which allowed the speaker to basically contract um, somewhat going northbound. And uh, John Keenan uh, has... Uh, Changed district in some ways, but not. Uh, in some ways, it's going back to a little bit of the old days, but not really. It's kind of strange. If you look at the maps over the last, last four redistrictings. But the short of it is that, you know, this is still a Quincy Senate seat. It's always going to be a Quincy Senate seat for the next decade, and I'm probably always going to be a Quincy Senate seat uh, in the long Even term. Population's growing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
So of course he contracted more back into Quincy. Uh, and so he got basically, uh, he got the east side of Braintree now. So you get, the west side goes to uh, Senator Timothy. The east side is uh, uh, John Keenan. He continues to travel through Holbrook uh, into Rockland and now Hanover. Okay. Abington is no longer part of the district, and uh, he loses a large portion of the west side of Braintree to, to uh, Walter Timothy. Uh, and, uh, you know, I came in the Senate when uh, Michael Morrissey had uh, Quincy, uh, a, third of Hol- a third of Braintree, seven eighths of Rockland, mm. half of Abington and Orr Norwell. And uh, those going even further back in time, remember when Quincy was really Quincy Avon. Uh, Braintree and Holbrook. Mm, wow. Okay. You know, going back further in time. Yeah. So the district has continued to a strong southbound, and uh, all the towns that uh, Senator Keenan lost, you know, ends up in a uh, Senator O'Connor's district because there's only a Senator that's next door that can actually touch it. Interesting. Yeah. Why that configuration was done to make uh, Senator Brady from Brockton's district a minority majority right. seat in the Senate. As you can see, you can see how the dominoes shift around. Uh, in the interim, both uh, Bruce Ayers and our friend Bill Driscoll are also um, minority majority districts. Hmm. So, so for Boston, the two big ones are uh, uh, Bruce Ayers and Bill Driscoll, and then you don't get to another minority majority rep seat until you get to Fall River New Bedford. Okay, so there have been some changes for sure, and I know at least one, I think the 7th Congressional District also gets shifted around a bit, but doesn't impact Quincy. No, I mean, the, uh, the congressional districts are, are big shift is going to be Western Massachusetts mm-hmm. because there's just not any growth out there. It's right. not. Everybody's moving east. Senator Lynch, I'm sorry, Congressman Lynch's district, you know, he was a senator. People forget he was the state yep. senator from, from uh, Southie. That's where I actually first met Steve. Um, so, uh, you know, he pretty much was close on the number anyway. I mean, obviously it's not Zach, but he was inside the red zone. So I, I didn't think it was going to be a whole lot of shift on his part. And uh, there's still a desire to keep a minority-majority congressional seat, which is an Anna Presley seat. Mm-hmm. Given the large uh, minority a number growth in uh, Boston, it, it wasn't too difficult just to rejoin Boston uh, and, and somehow um, create a lollipop a line to Randolph that uh, continue a minority-majority congressional district. Right. Uh, it's very difficult for any of the other congressional districts to do that because they don't have sufficient density. Right, yeah, exactly. Um, can we talk a little bit about ARPA funding, Tacky, and how it might affect Quincy, the federal pandemic relief money? Yeah, we had a, a, a pretty uh, long couple of days uh, last Thursday and Friday. Actually, we talked last Thursday before the debate began. Yep, that's right. About the ARPA funds, and you know, it addresses a lot of stuff from climate change to workforce training uh, to uh, housing issues as well as um, housing authorities. Uh, a, a very broad range of stuff, and we combined a co- uh, we combined the money from the FY twenty one surplus, which is about a billion for give or take, mm-hmm. and then you know, we took a portion of the Fed money, which is under five, just under five billion. Uh, so we took a portion out to form a three point eight billion dollar package. Um, so let's you know, see, one point four minus three point eight gives like two point uh, four, right? Two point six, two point six billion dollars of that four ish billion dollars. So um, uh, the most of the money that's left in the federal trust uh, that we have in the ARPA money is generally uh, directed towards uh, large infrastructure projects, main roads and bridges uh, that we'll go back to again once we find out what the federal package is down in Washington under $3.5 trillion infrastructure package. Right. Once we have an idea what that looks like, then we'll come back and revisit this issue. Okay. Um, and of course, you know, there's that still that almost $2 trillion of budget money for programs that the state will get a good chunk of. So we're still waiting to see what happens there. But one of the big exciting pieces of this is that, uh, you know, a, a substantial amount of money, $100 million, is going to go into windmill development. We want to build windmills in Massachusetts. Uh, given a huge uh, windmill block island, uh, block island project, you know, we approved uh, twice uh, variations of bills to have the state buy wind power. Uh, and the bids were very, very good for Massachusetts. It's just waiting for these things to get constructed. So if you guys don't know, you just don't put one up in your backyard. These windmills are going in the water and they got to find bedrock and they're going to be monstrous. Uh, so we would like to have those jobs in Massachusetts and focus on the South Coast. Uh, for those who uh, come from there know there, the unemployment rate is still very challenging down there. Yeah. So bringing the major industry such as windmill 
construction and repair and other ancillary business associated with is a huge economic benefit to the South Coast as well as uh, Rhode Island, quite frankly, because the South Coast and Rhode Island actually have very interconnected economies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's that's a huge piece on clean energy and job creation. Um, locally, uh, we got a few dollars here and there for, for various things. Uh, you know, we got um, some money for a dredging project. People have been hearing about talk about dredging locally in Quincy Bay. Uh, we got a little bit to start start this process going. Uh, got six hundred thousand dollars, which is not the whole nut. There's more money got to find, but we got to get started somewhere. Um, so hopefully, uh, there's other funding opportunities, that, whether it be a bond bill or cash, that can continue to add to that kitty, so to speak, on on putting uh, putting money together. We got four hundred thousand dollars uh, for the Squantum uh, boat ramp. I, uh, you know, very strong project with Bruce Ayers and John Keenan. We get ferry service. So we give a $400,000 to get that project moving again. We're going to, this is all piecemealing money together. We've got to eventually make this work. Um, you know, I got $200,000 um, for QCAP to upgrade uh, its food pantry. The uh, pandemic has shown uh, the need for massive upgrades in food pantries, especially given the need for social distancing. And we're not clear what the future holds of Delta, right? So there's some question marks. And the, uh, Appreciation Resources has a global food truck program mm -hmm. that is uh, moving forward. Another interesting piece about this um, bill includes uh, money for Afghan refugee resettlement. We're looking at probably about 2,000 plus uh, Afghan refugees coming in next year uh, as a resettlement. Yeah, into Massachusetts part of resettlement. Uh, refugees in Massachusetts is not a new a thing. We've been doing this for decades. Cambodians, Vietnamese, Sudanese, Nepalese. Uh, believe it or not, Nepalese had a natural disaster issue that made them refugees. That earthquake that leveled multiple villages. And mm. actually, mm -hmm. these Nepalese are here now. So, I mean, Afghan refugees has a, a long history of Massachusetts being very welcoming and uh, you know, helping uh, other folks uh, that have been displaced uh, to build a new life here. So, um, you know, we set aside some money for that. I suspect we may need some more money down the road, but right now we're looking at about a couple of thousand uh, really quickly coming Afghan uh, refugees. Um, other things about this, uh, we uh, dedicate some things on people of color. So, for example, particularly in education, you know, there's uh, not a lot of, of folks um, that are people of color that are educators. So there's actually a segment of, of this funding to uh, focus in on that. And I actually uh, got it a bit amendment approved with the help of the Asian caucus to ensure a complete inclusiveness on that program. So, you know, we make sure that uh, not just black and indigenous people, but also Latinx, Asians, immigrants and refugees, you know, as part of the uh, uh, encouraging uh, and uh, retention of educators in Massachusetts. Hmm, okay. Tend to forget, uh, you know, immigrants or refugees are a big part of our state population, and uh, they're very important to have them in our school systems, both at K through 12 and higher ed, to uh, provide a diversity of experience and cultural understanding of the number of different people that live here. Right. Yeah, I know Quincy Public Schools are making a concerted effort to try and make the uh, staff uh, educators more reflective of the student body. Yes, and. Uh, you know, the opera bill uh, actually has some uh, commitment uh, to do that and also to encourage more of it. So, I mean, that's an amendment I got through. There's not money attached to it, but it's important language. And, uh, you know, you know, I kind of explain to folks, I mean, uh, higher education created this term BIPOC, uh, yes. black and people of color. Now, I mean, we talk about Asian racism issues quite a bit the past year, but as I like to remind folks, people only remember the black, the indigenous, and then whatever. Uh, and this is just human nature. This is just how it is. And uh, this was created by higher education, this term, but not understanding the real ramifications of real life. In real life, people only remember the parts they can identify, not mm -hmm. the parts they can identify. So, you know, one of the goals of the Asian caucus is to ensure that all people are properly identified uh, in legislation of most people of color, not just say uh, two uh, of the aggregate groups, uh, make sure that all aggregate groups are properly reflected. Because this is just how people think. You say, you know, black, indigenous people of color, they just think of the first two words that are real words. The other three words don't mean anything. Right, right. You know, they're not, well, they're not defining. They're just, they're very ambiguous. Exactly. Welcome to the challenges of my life, folks. <laughs> I deal with my entire life. So, you know, now that, uh, you know, in position to address state policy, to bring greater inclusiveness has always been, 
my objective, uh, you know, to not forget other people of color, but also forget about immigrants and refugees that are here as well. So, um, you know, very thankful with the speaker as well as uh, you know, Ways and Means Chair Aaron Merkowitz, you know, on, on uh, putting up with me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you get, you right can bring a thorn in the side. <laughs> well, next time you can talk, uh, get the speaker on the line with you, I'm sure he will be on again at some point. You can discuss about uh, the difficulties of dealing with tacky. Oh, that's a whole other show, Tacky. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, that's how the, le- the Constitution designed the legislature, right, is to be uh, advocates for the people. And diversity, to me, is not, in, in, is not just about race in terms of uh, the legislature and not just about gender. It's diversity of life. Mm. And I think people forget that about legislature sometimes because they see it as a Democrat-Republican issue, not different walks of life issue. So... Uh, you know, there's always a large rotation of electeds. We, I think, have at least eight reps not coming back. There will be more uh, re- retiring this year as we go along. And we'll turn over between 16 and 25, give and take, you know, a few here and there uh, almost every year. Uh, you don't get, like, the big situation where uh, Speaker Mar- uh, Speaker uh, Dilio and, uh, you know, Speaker Mariano's uh, group of well into 50, I think it was 54 plus a bunch of special elections on top of that. And then you have um, my class of 39 special elections became 41. We don't get that rotation that big that quickly. But, you know, you get about 16 to 20, 25 at a time. And, uh, but it's important that you get people from different walks of life, different age groups. And now we're redistricting, redistricting uh, you know, perhaps more diversity of uh, different community outlooks. Mm-hmm. So every community we live in, the people that have a different outlook in life, and your elected officials reflect that out. Yeah, it's based on their life experiences, right? Exactly. Yeah. So we want to have always as much as people as much life experiences as possible in the legislature to give us more diversity of opinions regarding policy making. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, uh, and policy as equitable as possible, right? Absolutely. One of the sad things not being in the state house is the fact that we get to spend time with other members because it's an opportunity to find out you know where they grew up, you know what they done for a living, what their families like, and we share stories. And, uh, you know, when people want to talk about a policy issue between, uh, b- before my committee and between us, we talk about life mm-hmm. and they start to understand uh, why uh, they've uh, advocating for certain policy positions. Yeah. It's almost like a, you know, a brainstorming session, uh, out of that, uh, new policies, uh, emerge. Absolutely. Same thing with city councils, mm-hmm. same thing with selectmen, same thing in elected, elected town meeting, open town meeting is a little bit different. Yes, uh, those, we know what open town meeting is like, uh, but elected town meeting members, and of course members of Congress. And uh, as much as people watch the twenty-four hour cable news, which I do not enjoy, uh, you know, get this caught up in this kind of really, you know, dichotomy of, of Congress that overlooks the fact that when people are advocating, uh, they're advocating uh, for people that uh, that re- reflect who th- who they are too. Mm-hmm. They're, they're reflection of people they represent. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit about the situation with unemployment in Massachusetts, Techie? Uh, where does it stand right now? I think, uh, <laughs> I haven't looked at it this week, but I believe it's still floating right into the 6% zone. Yeah. Uh, we do want people that it's a little bit deceptive because if you're no longer unemployment, you're not considered part of unemployment. And Correct. Yeah. Seasonal workers are not adjusted for this number. Seasonal workers are going to add a couple more percentage points because tourist season is coming to a close probably another five or so weeks. Yes. Uh, and then you also have people that are unable to work because of severe disability or age. Um, so that's also a factor. So it's under 6%, but we all know that's a little higher than it is because of those other factors. But I mean, people are still having challenges finding um, people to go to work. Uh, it's very apparent when you go uh, eat out or go to retail, uh, there's still help wanted signs out there. It's a uh, very competitive uh, price structure still. It is a worker's benefit market on, on salaries and wages. Um, and, uh, you know, and we're going to see how the winter holds, just like last winter, we're holding our breath again. The Delta doesn't get strange uh, in terms of its infection rate uh, and the vaccination is sufficiently high enough to prevent massive outbreaks. Uh, we are still getting infection rates, and don't get me wrong, but we're trying to avoid a, a surge. Um, and uh, as we move indoors and people try to do holiday travel and people want to go traveling places that have lower vaccination rates, the risk level changes, especially mm. a disease that is so contracting so quickly with Delta and now Delta Plus, 
there's a plus now. Uh, contract so quickly, it can bring it back to and potentially infect others that are unvaccinated. Right. Um, in terms of in-person unemployment services, have those started back up again? Do you know? Uh, not really. Okay. I mean, I mean, the workforce development office in Quincy Center is open. I had actually talked to uh, Ron Yukabuchi uh, a few weeks ago, uh, but it's still a lot remote by appointment only. Okay. It's still a caution. Um, unemployment benefits, I still feel calls about that. I mean, expanded, extended unemployment benefits ended September. I mean, right. there is no more. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, folks, uh, you know, already got their first extension, isn't getting a, a second extension. So, you know, uh, people are out there. But also, don't forget, people are retiring now. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, people are retiring. I suspect are going to uh, next spring, there'll be more people retiring as they come to the decision that, you know, given this very life-changing experience we've both had, you know, how do you really want to live the next perhaps 10, 15, or 20 years of your days if you're healthy uh, left? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I think you're going to see that both in the private and public sector. Uh, the teachers are already in moving into uh, retiring earlier than expected as well. Right now. So uh, there'll be uh, probably more opportunities in different forms of public service uh, going into next summer as uh, people continue to look at their calendars and decide that, you know, I'd rather I try to live my rest of my life healthy and happy. Uh, I have it as opposed to uh, continue to be working uh, and perhaps in some cases putting yourself at high risk of potentially getting COVID. Right. Yes. There are a lot of uh, reprioritizations going on <laughs> for sure. Um, and yeah, I think you're right. It will, it will continue um, as well for sure into the future. What, uh, should we uh, look forward to in your local district, uh, Tacky, in the in the next couple of months? Um, well, uh, Halloween's come and gone, but the Montclair Walls and Association party could not go on because of the rain last Saturday. That's right. But they postponed it to Sunday uh, from 11 to 4, 11 to 5, I believe, again, at Bishop's Field. So people want to go out to that. Uh, it's an outdoor event. It's a family event. There'll be uh, you know, all the kids-related stuff and a live band and a food truck. Got food trucks. Remember the days we just had like pure barbecues and you hope things didn't go bad at a park? Uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, it's much- I am older than you realize, folks. I do remember some stuff. Uh, but yes, there'll be, you know, a, a food and entertainment. Uh, right. You know, yeah. the College Neck Congregational Church is having their uh, fair on the 13th. Oh. Uh, it neck. So you, you could want to drop in and say hi. Uh, my nephew has a play this weekend at Quincy High School. Okay. I don't even know what it is. I just been told I got to go. <laughs> you have to be there. Yes. I'll be there with mask on, sitting in the audience. Uh, we'll let people see me able to smile, but obviously enjoying uh, watching my nephew's senior year at Quincy High. And, nice. Um, you know, enjoying these family moments like everyone else, right? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, then what else is going on? Our Veterans Day is coming up next week. Right. Uh, my men talked to you before Veterans Day, but the Veterans Day parade is going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, weather pending uh starting around uh, quincy high school area walking to the world War one memorial uh the doughboy on hancock and furnish book and concluding uh, at uh, marymount park um so you know that's going to be on veterans day uh, people want to come out uh, weather pending um and then we got the christmas parade at the end of the month thanksgiving weekend uh, which is an odd. I still haven't got my official uh, notice, but you know, you do this long enough, you know what it's going to be, you know how it's right. going to go. But I mean, obviously, I'll get specific instructions, uh, especially with all the construction downtown Quincy, mm-hmm. about the entry points and where you line up to march and so forth. Again, you know, so this is weather dependent. Right. Um, what else is there going on at events? Uh, those are the ones I, I am aware of right now. I'm sure there's more coming. And I also remind folks, we go into holiday season. I mean, there's a number of local uh, charitable organizations do great work, uh, whether it be churches or food pantries or, or um, senior services or youth services. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Give some consideration on making, uh, you know, any kind of a donation uh, of any kind uh, to any of these organizations locally, because, you know, it's been a tough uh, time for them. They have not been any higher uh, conventional fundraisers. We can pack a room of three or 400 people at Greater Links, for example. Right. Uh, who does great work on our local organizations. Uh, you know, it's been, uh, people still uh, want to be very cautious and aware of other people's health issues. So, you know, if, you know, goes there listening here, you know, if you got, if you got, you know, pick a, 
local organization that you uh, really support, maybe consider writing a check or going online and making a payment uh, through credit card. Yep, you really will be helping uh, your neighbor. They all do uh, uh, yeoman's work uh, right here in the Quincy community. So absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's very important to uh, keep our money local. And it's not just buying local, but it's also donating local. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Sure. Uh, And as always, uh, you're available, Jackie, if folks want to get in touch with you. 617-722-2014, 617-722-2014, 617-722-2014. I do understand there has been a yet another issue regarding our phone system. Um, so you smash a button, uh, but if it becomes unbearable because uh, we've been having some technical difficulties again, I've heard some from folks trying to call us. Hmm. Uh, email me at tacky.chan at mahouse.gov, tacky.chan at mahouse.gov. Uh, the, uh, I do get a ton of email, uh, although it's a little bit better since I finished the last set of hearings. Uh, we had executive session on Monday, so that helped out too as we exact out some bills. Um, and of course, State Representative Tacky Chan is the Facebook page. We put my public hearings up there, and our recent executive session went up on Monday. So you can see how an executive session a committee is run if you really want to spend 30 minutes watching us going through the agenda items. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, it could be a, a civics lesson for folks. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to tell you it's exciting watching folks. <laughs> I do crack a few jokes. Am I okay. funny? No. Uh, but please do not leave a comment about that. Um, but, uh, you know, I generally discourage social media contacts because it's just, you'd be surprised exactly between uh, just the vomit invitations as well as spam and scam stuff I get, particularly yeah. on things like Facebook and Twitter. The sheer, because the nature of being a public official, you get all that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's just like, this is crazy. I'm trying to figure out what's what. Sure. So definitely do comments or Facebook messaging to me. Definitely send an email or phone call. Yeah, use the, use the official lines of communication if it's an important matter, for sure. Yeah, Yeah, and we set also the website, tachychin.org, for some phone numbers you can find uh, so you can avoid talking to us if you can find stuff on your own. But, uh, yeah, I think people underestimate exactly the, uh, the nature of a, a public uh, figure on social media where – it's not really constituents reading out to you. It's these, these crazy scamsters are all over the place because it's just just easy target. Sure. All right. Appreciate it. Always good to talk to you, Tacky. Always enjoy seeing you, Joe. Hope to see you in a week. 